Amen. Let's turn in our Bibles, if you would, to Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> and as I mentioned this morning, the uh, uh, men's uh, breakfast and work day, we've, uh, we're going to have to uh, reschedule that due to uh, not knowing what the situation will be weather-wise. Uh, so we'll just plan that another time. And also, again, uh, any of our widows or senior citizens, if you not, might need help in uh, getting prepared for the storm, especially if uh, they say that it might be heading in our direction. Uh, but, um, you know, at any, any case, if you need to make any preparation, if you just let us know if we can be of any help uh, in that area. You do need to understand, though, that there are limitations on what we could be, what could be done what uh, the men of the church could do. Uh, Diana Gates mentioned to me this morning for her and her mom that uh, they had some trees there in their yard that might fall. And I don't know, uh, you know, it's going to be hard to keep them from falling. Uh, we might could get enough men to hold them up, but uh, I don't know. What do you suggest about that, Sister Gates? No, no, okay, no suggestion. Just okay. All right, if you say so, we're good. Yes, ma'am. I, I missed. I missed that totally. <laughs> All right. There, there's a limit on what Brother Stanfield will do too. I guess if it means getting his hair wet, he's not going to volunteer for that all right seriously if we can be of any uh, help to uh, any of our widows or senior citizens if you let us know Philippi or not Philippians but Ephesians chapter 4 and uh, we'll read the beginning in verse 1 I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called with all lowliness and meekness with long suffering forbearing one another in love endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we are grateful for your grace that uh, you have shown to us through the Lord Jesus. Thank you for the salvation that uh, we have in him. Lord, we're grateful for that gift of eternal life. And I pray that you would help us to live uh, in this present life as it would be pleasing to you. Lord, we know that you have a plan and a purpose for us. You have a path that uh, you desire that we follow. And I pray, Lord, you'd help us to be faithful in uh, following you and obeying you, doing your will in our lives. And we pray that you'd uh, bless this time in your word tonight. Give us wisdom in the scriptures. Help us to rightly divide the word of truth. And Lord, we pray that uh, this seed of the Word uh, would fall into good ground and produce fruit in our lives that would magnify and glorify Christ. Help us in all that we say. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. I was thinking earlier uh, this week about this uh, uh, phrase, one particular phrase really, uh, in verse 1 where... Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. How do you do that? Uh, walking worthy of the vocation wherewith uh, ye are called. And I want us to think about that. And uh, there are some uh, answers in the Bible that help us know exactly uh, what uh, some of these things would involve. And uh, we uh, won't have time to look at everything. Matter of fact, we're not going to have time tonight to look at uh, everything that we find in verse 2 relative to that. But a couple of things that I do want us to uh, give our attention to. I want you to notice, first of all, and of course, uh, you know uh, this principle that any time you see the word therefore, uh, you come across that in the Bible, it's always good and it's helpful and beneficial to study and familiarize yourself with what has been being said. And so when Paul says there in verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, and so forth, 
we need to go back and uh, study and, uh, and, and, and see what he's been talking about. And we're not going to do all of that. The first three chapters in the book of Ephesians, really we could look at as doctrinal. Uh, basically, Paul is telling us what God has done for us. And the last three chapters, beginning in chapter 4, uh, would be focused on what that's supposed to mean for our lives uh, in our practical Christian living. And so, you just go back. Uh, Paul has spent, as I said, these first three chapters looking at uh, these manifestations of the grace of God and what we have in Christ because of that grace. Uh, chapters 1, 2, and 3 deal with that. And now, in chapter 4, uh, we are challenged with that practical application. Here's what we have in Christ. Here's what God has done for us. Now, here's how that's supposed to affect our lives, basically. And we're to live. The, the challenge of verse 1 in uh, chapter 4 it simply can be uh, understood by this, that we are to live in a manner that reflects the reality of the grace of God in our lives. That grace that he has been talking about in the first three chapters, now uh, how that grace is to be manifested in us. We're to live in a way that magnifies the Lord Jesus Christ and it is a positive testimony to the gospel of Christ. And we've studied that, uh, that, that, that particular challenge from the Bible before. Uh, back in Philippians chapter 1, in verses 20 and 21, it says, According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And then down in verse 27 of that same chapter, only let your conversation, uh, your manner of life, the way you live, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. In other words, our, our lives are to again be a positive testimony to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this admonition that we have in chapter 4 and uh, verse 1 of Ephesians, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, uh, that's practically the same as that in Philippians 1 and verse 27. The same challenge, the same admonition. Let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. And when you consider the great blessing of the work of grace, I should say, blessings, plural, because there's certainly more than one, isn't there? And when you think about all the great blessings that we have uh, because of that work of grace that God has uh, wrought in our lives, in our hearts, that should challenge us to desire to live our lives in such a way that that grace is manifested. The grace of God uh, magnified in our lives. So, uh, just, just for a moment, what, what are some of these things that God has done for us? Are some of these blessings that we have? Look back in chapter 1, quickly if you would, and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us in all spiritual blessings, or with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now that's a statement uh, of a fact. It says God has done that. God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Look at verse 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. Now that is going to happen. This is something that God has already decreed. And that word predestination there, don't let that throw you. That is referring to what God is going to do. We are predestined to be like Christ. Now that is a blessing because of the grace of God. 
Look at verse 6. This is one of my favorite verses. I love this verse. He says, To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. Accepted by who? Accepted by God the Father. How? In the Beloved. That's the only way we're accepted before God or accepted by God. It is in Jesus Christ. And uh, the, the only way that anybody can ever uh, come into that right relationship with God whereby they are accepted by God, it's not going to be on the basis of anything that we can do. Amen. I cannot be accepted by God because I'm a good person, because I'm not. Uh, I can't be accepted by God uh, by good works. I may be able to do some good works, but how, how do you know when you've ever done enough? And there's a lot of things that would enter even into that, wouldn't there? We're not saved by works. And on and on and on you could go. The only way that we're accepted uh, by God is... In the beloved. Look at verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Forgiveness. That's a great blessing to have. Amen. And uh, I hope we don't take that for granted as Christians. The fact that God, on the basis of the shed blood uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ, has forgiven us. And I rejoice to know that His forgiveness is full and complete. And that's on, only in the Lord Jesus Christ. So you can go on and on in chapter 1, chapter 2, uh, and into in chapter 3. And uh, we see uh, Paul referring to various things that, that we have uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ because of the grace of God. And so now he comes to chapter 4 and he says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. I'm going to look at some words. And uh, obviously that word walk there, that's referring to our manner of life, the way we live. And we're not going to uh, concentrate on that. But that next word, I do want us to uh, give our attention to that for a few minutes. He says that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. And uh, the word worthy there, it doesn't mean that you can earn that or that you can deserve that. Uh, don't they, and, and a lot of times I think people get the idea that what Paul is saying there uh, somehow uh, gets us into that area of salvation by works, of pleasing God by our works, that we can earn, that we can uh, merit uh, His favor. And that, it's not going to happen. He's not talking at all about something that we deserve or something that we earn by our own efforts and so forth. The word worthy there just simply means appropriately. You walk appropriately. You walk worthy of the vocation wherewith uh, we're called. Uh, we read Philippians 1 verse 27 a few minutes ago. Let me uh, reference that verse again. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. It comes from the same word. Uh, worthy uh, there in verse 1. Uh, and, and the question that I should ask, and this is really what got me to thinking along these lines, asking myself the question, is my life appropriate before God as a Christian? Is it appropriate uh, to what God has called me not only to do, but to be? And both those things are important, aren't they? Uh, my, am I walking worthy of the vocation wherewith uh, we're called? Uh, is my life... A, you know, it would solve a great deal of difficulty in our lives if uh, we would examine ourselves from time to time uh, on a daily basis, really. 
and probably even uh, more frequent than that. It, it wouldn't be too much for us to examine ourselves hourly, would it? Because it doesn't take but a moment to get out of fellowship with God, does it? And, and uh, if we could just be conscious and then sensitive to the uh, fact, the biblical truth that God desires that we live, that we walk worthy, that we walk appropriately uh, to uh, the uh, vocation wherewith we are called. And so is our life, is my life worthy of what God, is it appropriate for what God uh, has uh, purposed and planned for us? Uh, that's a serious question. And uh, it's one that uh, we need to answer in our own hearts. But then notice another word there, that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Now that's not to be understood as a job. Uh, let, when we read that verse, let's not allow ourselves to be uh, limited in our thinking and, and come to the conclusion that, uh, well, he, he expects me to do the job that uh, he wants me to do. That would be included in this. But this is not talking about just a job. Uh, you know, even in the spiritual sense, life, sometimes I wonder if people read a verse like that and they say, well, that's talking about a pastor. He's the one with the vocation uh, in the church. He's the one got the job in the church. No, no, this is not just for pastors. This is for every Christian. Every Christian is to be concerned about walking worthy of the vocation wherewith they are called. It is every Christian's responsibility to uh, do that. In uh, <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 4, uh, well, that's where you are. Look down to verse 4. He says, There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. The word calling there, same word that's translated vocation back in chapter uh, 4 and verse 1. Down in verse 18, he says, The eyes of your understanding, or chapter 1 and verse 18, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Again, the word calling. Uh, same word, vocation. It's also found in Philippians 3 and verse 14 where Paul said this, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And so this vocation in verse 1 is simply that life to which God has appointed us that he has called us to live as his children. And he says, you're to walk worthy of that. You're to walk uh, worthy. You're to walk appropriately uh, worthy of that vocation, that calling to which you have been called. God has a plan for us. God has a design for our lives, uh, our lives. And sometimes I wonder if, if we're naive. Now, I know none of us would admit this, but it seems like sometimes we're tempted uh, to approach the Christian life as, okay, now, now we're saved and uh, basically God just leaves us to ourselves and says, okay, you're going to heaven when you die. Uh, live your life upon the earth best way you can. Get by the best way you can and, and uh, hope you do okay with it. no. God has got a blueprint for us. He's got a design for us that is known as His will for our lives and He has let us know a lot about that. And if we are going to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called, then we need to understand that uh, now that I'm saved... I'm no longer my own. My life is to be yielded to him and, and his plan and his purpose, his, his design for my life is what I'm to be pursuing and seeking. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9, there's another verse that uh, speaks about this, this calling. First, uh, verse 9 of chapter 1 says, God is faithful by whom ye were called, now listen to this, unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. That is a glorious privilege. God has called us to or unto this fellowship of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Since God saved us, he, his plan and his purpose for us uh, would include fellowship with his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. What a great blessing uh, and that's, again, because of His grace. Nothing else. And so, God has called us to that. You don't have to wonder. You don't have to pray and seek uh, the will of God concerning this by saying, Lord, do you want me to fellowship with Christ? Do you want me to walk in fellowship with the Lord Jesus? I mean, that is clear in His Word that that is what He has called us to. And so, <clears throat> think about this. God has called us unto salvation in Christ. Uh, he has called us to fellowship with Christ. And that results in our having a task. And I believe this is where we can uh, understand that, that word vocation there. We do have a task. We do have a job. Uh, given us by God, we have a responsibility before God, uh, given us by Him to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we have been called. And so, do, do, do we have that desire? Do, do we want in our lives to go beyond just being saved? And I'm not minimizing that at all. That is the foundation uh, of the Christian life, of course. But uh, after we're saved, this is God's calling for us that we're to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. Now, what would a walk that is approved by God, a life that is appropriate to the life to which He has called us, what would that include? Well, a lot of things. You basically could could study from chapter 4 on into chapter 6 and uh, you would find out several things there that would uh, be part of this worthy walk before the Lord. We're just going to look at two things uh, in that next verse there, verses 2 and 3 really. Uh, give us these things and we'll probably just uh, get to verse 2. Look at what, if you're going to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you have been called as a Christian, look at the first thing that he mentions there in verse 2. He says, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. That's what God's called us to. That, that's the vocation. That's our job. That's our task. That's the responsibility that God has given us uh, to pursue in our lives. Lowliness. That uh, refers to humility of mind, modesty of mind. Now, modesty is appropriate uh, in other areas of Christian life. Modest dress uh, for uh, really men and women. Used to, modest dress, you're thinking about women mostly, but boy, nowadays, you've got to include men in that as well. Uh, and that's another, another study in itself. But uh, this is talking about our own minds, our view of ourselves, lowliness, uh, modesty of mind. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3, it says this, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Same word. Let each esteem other better than themselves. How are we doing on that? In lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. We might say, Lord, are you kidding? Yeah, you know, you mean I'm supposed to think that somebody else is better than I am? 
And we could probably think of uh, uh, several folks that it'd be hard for us to do that with, wouldn't it? Uh, well, if we are to walk worthy of this vocation wherewith we are called, then that is going to include that I have the right attitude about myself. That I understand myself based not on what my opinion of myself is, but upon what God tells me in His Word about me. Colossians 3 and verse 12 says, Put on therefore is the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind. Same, same word. Meekness, he says, long-suffering. In 1 Peter 5 and verse 5, he says, Likewise ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. Same thought, same idea there. God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Lowliness. If, if we're to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. If, if, if my life is to be examined and approved by God as being appropriate uh, concerning what He wants me to be, then it is going to have to include what He calls their lowliness. Somebody has said that lowliness is holy humbleness. You know, there is a false humility in there. It's usually not too difficult to pick that up. Uh, a a, a projected humility. I was reading one, uh, one writer, and I can't remember the book or whatever now, I think it was on my computer. Uh, one writer said that uh, this, this matter of lowliness, this humbleness of mind is something that every Christian should, should continually seek after, but the very moment that you think that you have attained it, that's when you forfeit it. And boy, that is, that's true too, isn't it? Uh, holy humbleness. It's a, it's a humbleness. It's a lowliness. It's a uh, modesty of mind that really comes from a right relationship with God. Uh, <clears throat> I've read that uh, this, this word that's used here, lowliness, and uh, the humility that's connected with that. I've read that the Romans that neither the Romans nor the Greeks had a word in their vocabulary uh, for humility. Uh, that, that concept of humility was foreign to their thinking and they, uh, they, they, they didn't like that kind of thinking at all because they, they emphasized the self. They emphasized asserting yourself and being powerful and humility, uh, or that, that idea of humility, uh, they, they just abhorred. And uh, in that same section, same article I was reading, it said that uh, in all probability, this word, uh, the Greek word that came to be translated humility, was in all probability coined by Christians. And some people believe that it was probably the Apostle Paul that did that. Because the, the known world at that time didn't know anything about what God was talking about here. Uh, that, 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 that was uh, totally out of their uh, ability to understand and to reason about. And they, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the unbelieving world did uh, come to use that word that is translated humility in the Bible, but it was always in a derogatory sense, and most of the time it was used in reference to Christians. And it was not a compliment that the Romans or the Greeks uh, intended when they used that word. They, they looked 
at uh, this, this biblical notion of humility as, as a weakness. And anybody that was humble in the biblical sense, they, view, they, they viewed them with pity. Uh, well, you know, the world is out of step with God on a whole lot of things, isn't it? And uh, this would be another one of those things. As far as God is concerned, humility is one of the characteristics of life to which God has called every Christian. Uh, every one of us. That is part of this walk. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called with all lowliness. Humility of mind. Modesty of mind. You remember Romans 12 and verse 3? For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. That, that's, that's the way God puts that, isn't it? That is God's uh, direction for us. He says, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Well, if we're not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, how should we think of ourselves? How, how can we fulfill or obey Romans 12 and verse 3? Well, I want you to notice how Paul describes himself in the book of Ephesians. He does this in other places as well, but right here in Ephesians. Look back at chapter 3. Notice verse 7. He says, Wherefore I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. And here it is. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. That's what Paul thought of himself. I wonder how we would compare. That, that's, that, that's Paul's... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, walk in, in this uh, work of humility or the, the work that God had called Paul to do and I'm talking about not his preaching and not his teaching, not his writing but that work that was his life uh, Paul certainly walked worthy he walked in lowliness because it was not pretense it was not uh, just some false uh, phrase that he used to try to impress people. Uh, remember, it was the Holy Spirit of God that led Paul to write that. And he said unto me who am the le less than the least of all saints. In Ephesians 3 and verse 1, look at what he says there. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you all. Now that's what he thought of himself. That, that, uh, that was his opinion of himself. Uh, he was a bondservant to Christ. A prisoner. Uh, do we spend a lot of time thinking, meditating upon the fact that we too are supposed to be bondservants of Jesus Christ? Uh, we're supposed to be yielded to him and he is supposed to be our master. I'm reminded that Jesus said, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? And so at some point in our lives as, as Christians, recipients of that marvelous grace of God that Paul expounds in these first three chapters, at some point we've got to come face to face with the responsibility that we have to acknowledge that, Lord, I'm... <laughs> I'm, I'm your servant. You, you, you bought me. You redeemed me. And like Paul, I realize I'm to be your bondservant. But then notice also in that same verse, he says, I'm the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Paul lived for others, didn't he? Amen. His whole ministry. Uh, he was the apostle to the Gentiles. His life was spent not for himself, but for others. And in particular, taking the, God, the, the gospel of Christ to the Gentiles. And then again right here in chapter 4 and verse 1, we see that again. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. That's what Paul thought of himself. 
That, that's how, that, that's what, uh, one thing that uh, enabled Paul to have the right thoughts about himself. He was ever conscious of his dependence upon the grace of God and he saw himself in the light of God. And uh, boy, when we do that, that'll help us uh, have the right, uh, right attitude toward ourselves, won't it? You're familiar with it, the passage, Isaiah chapter 6, in verse 1. Isaiah writes this, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And that takes us back to that fellowship with Christ that we have been called to, 1 Corinthians we looked at the verse a moment ago. Fellowship with Christ will help us cultivate and it'll help us maintain and have a right attitude and opinion of ourselves. We read in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15 again. This is the Apostle Paul says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. You remember in Luke chapter 5, the uh, disciples had toiled all night and caught nothing. And Jesus uh, told them uh, where to cast their nets. They did and uh, got a great catch of fishes. And Peter... Uh, saw the glory of Christ in all of that. And he said this in verse 8, Depart from me, uh, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. You know, being, being in fellowship with Christ and walking close to Him is not going to result in our thinking that we are better than anybody else. We've said that many times before. It will result in our becoming conscious of our own sinfulness and our own depravity and our own depend dependence upon the grace of God. Job, chapter 42 and verses 5 and 6. Here's Job's testimony. He said, I've heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee, wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Uh, let's, let, let, let's allow the Lord to work in our hearts uh, to bring us to that point. That's a hard point to come to, isn't it? I abhor myself. I repent in dust and ashes. Uh, that's how Paul could write about lowliness. Uh, the opposite of uh, Christian humility, this lowliness, is uh, self-centered pride. And that is easily seen in Lucifer himself. And I'm not going to take the time to uh, read it. My time's getting gone. But back in Isaiah chapter 14, we read about his fall. And uh, five times, I believe it was, in uh, Isaiah 14, Lucifer said this, I will, I will, I will, I will. And none of it was the will of God for him. All of that uh, flowed from uh, that desire really to be his own God. And of course, we know how that ended up. Walking worthy of the vocation to which we are called means walking in sincere humility before God, remembering that it is only by the grace of God that 
we can do so. Uh, we're not going to be able to walk worthy of uh, this vocation wherewith we are called in our own uh, power, in our own strength, in our own wisdom. Uh, it is all of God. And we must be dependent upon Him and yielding to Him. Notice quickly that next word, and I'm just going to have to hurry and get through. Uh, with all lowliness, he says, and meekness. Now, they sound similar, don't they? And they really would be similar. But this thought of meekness uh, basically is, is the matter of gentleness. And again, just like the Romans and uh, the Greeks thought that the concept of humility was really weakness. There are a lot of people today that uh, view meekness as, uh, as a weakness. Well, that's not the way the Bible uh, presents meekness. It presents it as a positive thing. And it refers to that, and I like this, which is mild-spirited. I, I like that definition of it. I believe that's right. Meekness, mild-spirited, self-controlled. It's the opposite of a vengeful spirit. It's the opposite of a vindictive spirit. It's the opposite of somebody that, that wants to get even with somebody else and make sure that they get what's coming to them. You see, we, we, we uh, are in grave trouble when we take it upon ourselves uh, to want to determine what uh, other people have coming to them. Uh, the Bible says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And if I want to trade into that area that God reserves for himself, I'm walking on dangerous ground, aren't I? Amen. And that's not, that's not the kind of life that God has called us to. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called with all lowliness and meekness. A, a, a gentleness of spirit, mild, spirited, and, and self-controlled. Not, uh, you know, we make excuses sometimes, and I, I, I think sometimes what happens is that we make them so often that we come to believe that God accept, accepts them as an excuse. They're not. Uh, God, uh, God didn't tell us these things in His Word and then he's going to turn right around uh, when we refuse to apply these things to our lives and say, well, I know you did the best you could. Uh, not it. Uh, this, this matter of meekness, a couple of things. It is the fruit of the Spirit. Remember Galatians 5 and 22 and 23? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness. Temperance, against such there is no law. And so I need to be, if my life is to be such that I'm walking worthy of this vocation wherewith I have been called by God, then I need to understand I do not have the ability, I do not have the power to produce that in the energy of my flesh. Matter of fact, my flesh will do just the opposite. My flesh will want to be uh, expressing itself and my flesh will uh, want uh, vengeance and uh, everything that goes with that and so I must have the filling of the Holy Spirit of God if this fruit of meekness is to be manifest in my life and therefore as that and you know it's a wonderful thing the, 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 the picture that God gives us here. Uh, he's provided everything that we need in order for us to do what verse 1 tells us to do. God knows we don't have the power to produce that in ourselves. So He fills us with the Holy Spirit. And then He tells us that this matter of meekness in particular is a fruit of 
of the Spirit. And so, instead of being controlled by my flesh, instead of being controlled by my old nature, uh, I, I need to be controlled by the Holy Spirit if I'm going to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith I'm called. So it's the fruit of the Spirit. It also is Christ-like. And really, those two things would go together, wouldn't they? The filling of the, the, the fruit of the Spirit and being Christ-like. Jesus said this in Matthew 11 and verse 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Was Jesus weak? No. Was he meek? Absolutely. And one of the best ways for me at least to understand this biblical thought of uh, biblical meaning of meekness is this. It was a word, th this word meekness, it was a word that was used to refer to wild animals and uh, others as well that were tamed. And they used it especially of horses that had been broken and trained. And the horse was just as powerful as he ever was. The horse could run just as fast as he ever could. But the difference is that power, that strength, that speed is under the control of his master now. And the horse just doesn't run wild uh, on his own. He is controlled. He's still powerful just as much as he ever was. But he is under the control of the trainer and his master. Can run just as fast, but only when and where the master wants him to go. And that's the way it should be with us, isn't it? Uh, our, uh, what, what abilities, what power, what authority we may have, it must all come under the control of our master. And <clears throat> Christians, believers, who are meek, are in control of their spirits. Uh, it, it's, it's not, the, it, it's not a, a person that is Meek in the biblical sense is not one that is constantly flying off the handle, constantly giving you a piece of their mind, constantly losing their temper. I guess we all do that to some degree, but we're talking about being controlled by those things instead of the filling of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, meekness does not mean the absence of anger. There are some things we ought to be angry about. Right here in this same book, chapter 4, uh, same chapter, verse 26, uh, uh, God says this, Be ye angry and sin not. There, there's a big difference in that, isn't it? And you know, if you just simply looked up the word meekness in your Bible, did a study on that word, it'll reveal several things. Let me just give you two quickly and i got to close. One is this, the meek Christian readily receives the word of God. They don't resist the Bible. They don't debate the Bible. They don't argue the Bible. They don't argue with God. The meek Christian receives readily God's Word, James 1, 21. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted Word which is able to save your souls. And so one, one gauge... Uh, one instrument, one method that might help me and determine it, if I'm walking worthy of the vocation uh, wherewith I've been called is this. What is my attitude toward the Bible? How do I receive the Word of God? I'm to receive it uh, really by faith and with joy and submitting myself to it. And then also, the meek Christian seeks to restore those who are overtaken in a fault. Look in Galatians 6. Don't look there, just listen to it if you would. Galatians 6, 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, 
lest thou also be tempted. Uh, the meek Christian, the, the, the Christian who is allowing God to direct their steps in his will and according to his purpose, uh, walking worthy of the vocation wherewith uh, they're called, uh, that meek Christian is going to want to see those who've fallen by the wayside restored. Amen. And he'll do that. She'll do that in the spirit of meekness because we realize this, you know, that could be me. Very, very easily could be me. That's exactly what he says, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Now in closing, <clears throat> do we desire our lives, you, you and I that are here tonight, do we desire our lives to be worthy, uh, a, a worthy walk of the vocation wherewith we are called? That's what God has called us to. It's His desire for us. Lowliness, meekness. Are we walking in humility? Remembering that it is only by the grace of God that we have this privilege in the first place. That we have this standing in Christ. That we have this acceptance by God. Do we uh, evaluate ourselves not in the light by comparing ourselves with other people, but do we evaluate ourselves by God Himself? If we do, then I believe we're going to come to the same conclusion that Isaiah did. Woe is me. Uh, are we walking in meekness? This worthy walk, uh, this vocation, this life that God has called us to, is that a, a life of gentleness? Are we hard-hearted mean-spirited. You say, surely not Christians. Yes. Surely Christians can be that way. I remember a pastor some years ago right here on the peninsula uh, told me, he said, uh, Brother Coffey, I never knew that Christians could be so mean-spirited. Uh, well, the truth is, we're all capable of that. Uh, so let's not, let's not allow those things to characterize our walk. Let's allow the, uh, the, these characteristics that God has clearly laid down in His Word to uh, provide uh, the goals and uh, purpose of our, our lives. Let's bow for prayer.